If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Our guest today is Vanessa Canning. Vanessa is an eventing specialist coach, competitor and trainer. She started coaching in 2006, so she's been coaching for quite a while. She's managed to build up a variety of students of all ages and ability, but the main thing that she enjoys working with are people who want to work with their horse as a team with a focus on the improvement of the relationship between horse and rider, and lucky all of her current students have got this as a focus. Now, how are you today, Vanessa? Very well, thank you, Glenna. Thanks really? for interviewing me. Oh, great to have you here. Now, Vanessa, you know we started with a favourite quote. What have you got for us? Well, my quote's a, a non-horse-specific quote, mm-hmm. and it's something that I've had around from my childhood, which is nothing great has ever been achieved without passion. Yes. And I apply that very much to all aspects of the horse industry because not only do we need to love horses to be in it, but a love for all the uh, the hard work and the effort that goes into it. Yep, yep, yep. All right. And I think, you know, I'm just thinking about the amount of coaches I talk to about if you're going to get into the horse industry, what are the prerequisites, what do you need? And they say passion. You know, you've got to have a reason for doing what you do and if you don't enjoy it, you shouldn't be in it. You know, that's the reason that people get into it is because they do have a passion for horses and do have a passion for the life with horses. Exactly. It's a tough industry. It's a very levelling industry. Um, horses um, can do that to people. You can be going brilliantly one day in a competitive sense or um, have more students than you can fit in and then all of a sudden the wheels come off or half your students' horses get foot abscesses <laughs> or they go on a spell and it's just an industry that you need to, um, yeah, really love um, and keep getting up and, and keep putting in Yeah, yeah. because we sure. don't do it for the money. <laughs> mm, mm, for sure, for sure. Tell us about what your first memories were with horses. Did you have a first memory that you've got when you first started to ride? Yeah, or- yeah. Mine was pro- just a holiday exposure. So mm-hmm. I'm from a suburban background, not a horsey family, and it was by all thing of all things going on a trail ride on a sheep farm. Yep. And I just couldn't believe that this thing existed. Mm-hmm. Was you know the ability to ride, and as a total beginner, it just clicked. And I was ten at the time, and then mm-hmm. I was just never stopped pushing <laughs> to do more. What do you remember of that day? Do you remember the name of the horse or something that happened or something that made your heart beat a bit fast? What was it? Yeah, I do actually remember the name of the horse. It was yeah. a, a beautiful piebald stock horse called um, Domino. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a working a working sheep station, so it was a working horse. Um, it was the sense of achievement of working or sitting at that stage as a 10-year-old beginner, sitting on Mm. a living, breathing animal and being able to work with it, influence it, but also be influenced by it. I hadn't Mm. come across anything like that before and I'm still blown away, you know, when you go around a cross-country course as to how, um, how much of an interaction is between horse and rider. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's a real partnership, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Tell us, because you've been coaching for a while, how did you start coaching? What made you decide that you wanted to be a coach? You know, starting to teach people, help people. Yeah. Yeah, I sort of came to coaching as secondary to wanting to work in the horse industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent four years at uni 
couple of years working in my trained profession and I was only in my early 20s and I thought there's got to be more to life than this. What, what did you train as, Vanessa? I'm an, I'm an occupational therapist. Okay, yep. um, which I use actually a lot of those skills yes. um, in my coaching. And I thought I need something more than this. I was trying to fit in competing um, a couple of horses around working full time out of the industry and just not enjoying either. So I um, actually spoke to a coach of mine and it was his suggestion and I really never thought I'd enjoy teaching um, and that side of it as much as I have um, mm, and I've mm. been doing it full time since then. Yep, yep, yep. So for someone to be a coach and even work in the horse industry, what sort of character traits and core skills do they need? You know, forget about the riding skills and the horsemanship skills, but before they even start that, what sort of person do they need to be to work in the industry and, um, you know, be able to cope with the industry? Yes, well, as I said before, the passion. Mm -hmm. I do think it goes a lot deeper than just a passion for horses. So I think just a love of horses isn't enough. Yep. Um, It's too tough an industry. Um, I think um, hard work is probably right up there on the list. But also, I mean, it's hard work in many industries. It's that resilience to keep going to keep um, looking for opportunities, to keep getting back up when things don't go according to plan. And, I mean, that can be in relation to a horse or a job opportunity or fluctuations of clients. It's just that, yeah, persistence and resilience. Another one is probably an ability to keep learning and question and adapt. Um, It's a moving and a modernising industry, I think, and an old-fashioned philosophy might not hold you in good stead. So that that constant ability to change. I think as that's well. something that you brought in there. You know, the ability to adapt because the industry is adapting. So even though the horse itself is not changing, a lot of our understanding and I think the work that you know, just the science-based work. There's a lot more knowledge within the horse industry now that um, some of the old tales that we used to do just Mm -hmm. don't hold it anymore. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, I'm in my late 30s, but I still see a huge variation in when I was learning to ride, you know, what I'd call a very old school riding school, which was a great foundation but I wouldn't do a lot of the things with the kids that I teach these days. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't do a lot of those things. Um, and, yeah, I've sort of seen a change only in the couple of decades I've been in the industry, so goodness knows where. Yep. It's going to be in another 10 years' time. I better learn a whole lot more. Yeah, to keep yeah, up. yeah, for sure, mm. for sure. What do you think's the best thing about the industry, working in the industry? Um, I won't say because you get to work with horses because once you turn your hobby into um, work, it can on some days just be work. Um, So what really surprises, well, shouldn't surprise me, but at the end of the day is having helped someone when someone just says, oh, thank you, that made a lot of sense or I really understand that now or that made my horse feel you know, better or happier mm-hmm. and coming home and go, I actually made a, a difference to yeah, yeah, a yeah. person, but also the horse. If if the rider's happy, they generally are therefore able to um, keep their horses happier, less pressure, and everyone gets what they want. And I, I come home with a great feeling of satisfaction. Yep. yep. Pretty much what keeps me going. Mm. Good, good. What about people who've influenced you? Who was the coach that suggested that you work in the industry if you want to keep competing? Yeah, well, it was actually um, Murray Lampard. So that that makes a difference. um, I mean, that was a career decision there. Yeah. It was, it was. And he was an old coach of mine, you know, when I was younger and then, you know, just someone you could talk to. And that was a bit of a an opportunity that Mm -hmm. came up. He's a very experienced coach and rider. so that was a, a bit of a change. And, I mean, there's been others that I have had huge influences that I still use their 
exercises <laughs> or their ideas or their phrases. Um, yeah, so who, who are they? People, uh, um, I worked with a breaker trainer called David Simons, who's yes. down. Um, I think we did an interview with him just a short while ago. Yeah, Rush. Yes, um, I worked with him. Well, I I turned up. Uh, he got me riding the breakers, and mm-hmm. while I did that, he imparted knowledge, That's a true great. trade of um, trade of skills in the yep. horse industry, and. Um, he has an amazing temperament and the knowledge, mm. um, and I use a lot of that. I do work with a lot of young horses, and I can also do a lot of remedial work with horses on the ground that have riders that have difficulties. So he was an important one. Mm. Mm. He's got an amazing story as well. So if people want to listen, they can go to horsechats.com, search for David Simmons if you've got your app, or just go to horsechats.com and slash David Simmons. Anyone else you'd like to talk about or would you like to go on and talk about a horse who might have influenced you? Um, Look, there's probably one more coach that really turned my high-level riding around, Mm -hmm. um, and that was Jamie Coman. Yes. uh, Who's a show jumper. And just the... um, the effort, I would say, that he put in to fit me in at you know seven o'clock in the morning mm-hmm, because I've got a day of coaching, yep, <laughs> so yep. I don't, I can't turn up at lunchtime. Yeah, yeah. Um, for a lesson, you know, it was seven o'clock. The sun wasn't even up. Um, he'd fit me in, and just an amazing patience to bring one of my weaker weaker areas up to my strength. And because of it, I've just learnt so much and now actually that's one of my strengths I think in teaching mm-hmm. is the show jumping because I've had to learn it from the ground up yeah mm. so yep. he'd be yep. one of my recent influences good good and I think if people want to hear his story it's horsechat.com search for Jamie search for Coleman you'll find him tell us about a horse then that might have influenced you I'd be lying to say if they didn't all, yeah. yes, because you learn something from all yes. of them. And I mean even including my student courses. Um, but I'd be lying if it, to say it wasn't my last um, good horse mm-hmm. uh, who was Platinum Fire, a big grey horse that uh, went through from green broke to three star. Yep. Um, an amazingly, I'm going to say, complicated <laughs> personality <laughs> of a horse. Some of my fellow competitors said they wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. Um, And it was found that, yes, while complicated and while there are weaknesses, there was such amazing strength and he taught me so much. Nothing was simple. Everything had to be (laughs) built from the ground up um, and revisited frequently. Um, But... His attitude was, I'll give it a go no matter what. So he let me learn all the way to three-star, which you don't want to make too many mistakes mm-hmm. on the way. But he he let me learn with just an attitude of, yeah, okay, I'll yeah, give it another yeah. go. What did you think when your fellow competitors said they wouldn't touch him? Did that sort of spark a bit of a fire or what did you think then? Yeah, it made me feel, um, I thought, yeah, you're probably right. And if I knew what I was getting myself in for, would I sign up for him again? No, but it made me feel a little bit um, proud of my achievements um, and that I had persevered with the horse. And don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, he's a beautifully bred horse and a beautifully started horse. It was just his temperament that made him a a higher um, maintenance horse to have. But they say the good ones always are. (laughs) And um, I'm currently not riding him because I've I've got a toddler and another baby on the way. And I'm so proud because he's out competing with a junior rider. Yep. And everything he's learnt, um, you know, the horse is actually being a really consistent competitor. And I just feel like he was actually my first child, my first successful <laughs> child I raised. Yeah, and he's out yeah. in the world doing his thing That's before good. he's ready to retire to the, yeah. the, the back paddock. Good, good. Now, you said a couple of times, you know, you're proud of the achievements that you made and you're proud that he's out there with a the junior rider now. But what's your proudest moment, you think, with horses? If it's recently, it yep. would have been riding at three-star level. Yep. Okay. That was something that I thought um, 
I, I think that's a you know cut above. Then you go up through the levels, and it might be easy to get horses to one star. And I know there's there's um, plenty, a big pool of riders out there competing at three star now, and I take my hat off to all of them. Um, but for me, that was a a pretty big step. Mm-hmm. I think. Okay. Mm. All right. Now tell us about juggling. You know your families and coaching and everything else. What's the biggest challenge juggling your your family and your coaching? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it was even before I had children. Um, it was balancing horses are twenty four seven every weekend, coaching into the evening, mm-hmm. and I've always tried to keep a balance in life. I mm-hmm. always wanted a life outside of horses and outside of coaching. So, whether I've done it successfully or not, <laughs> I'll see. But I've always tried to um, not live, breathe and work horses. So take a night off, take a weekend off. Um, And I guess whenever things have got busy, I'll often take, um, I'll give the horses a couple of weeks off, not because they need a spell. I might need a spell. So that was my way of of juggling it when I was competing or coaching every weekend. Okay, yep. Yeah, it's a little different at the moment. I, I'm not riding competitively. I found it's too hard with um, with the little little children, but I, I'm sort of waiting until they're just old enough to um, to be a little more um, involved in school and then get back into it. So I'm sort of taking a oh, – it's a bit of a break, which I found <laughs> quite challenging, to be honest, because okay. it – Riding was everything, so taking a break has been very challenging. Um, but I'm I'm getting the the excitement and the energy to start again. Good, good. Putting your coaching cap on, thinking about you know you go out to a clinic or students that you haven't seen before to teach them show jumping. What's a common fault? A common show jumping fault that you see, and how could you fix it? Um, something you common that you see when you get a new group of riders. What I probably encourage the most is the rider has, I'm going to say, two main roles, which is your rhythm, which is your energy and your speed, and your line. Those are your jobs. Mm -hmm. And let the horse work underneath you. Um, Don't tell it when to jump. Don't tell it when to make the last stride. Don't try and overthink or over-anticipate. Let the horse work underneath you. So I encourage riders do their jobs and then ultimately do less. A lot of people want to do too much at the face of the jump. And especially if I'm working with horses that either have issues because they rush um, or stop or maybe riders who are more anxious, they are more likely to want to or feel the need to do something at the jump to make the horse jump. And what I've learned... Um, because I made all those mistakes myself, was you do your jobs, you let the horse get there, you let it jump, and it becomes clever, agile, knowledgeable in, in its own abilities, and you end up with the best of both worlds. So okay. you do your job, you let the horse do it. Yep, yep, yep. Thinking about your students who want to focus on the improvement of the relationship between horse and rider, what's the main thing you focus on? What's the main thing you teach them? What's the main lesson to them? Probably is an overall, apart from, you know, all the individual, the importance of individual aspects, is I'm going to say think like a horse or be aware of how your horse thinks. Why is it responding to you in a certain way? Why is it responding to the environment in a certain way? Um, Horses are instinctive uh, prey animals that drive them. They are so consistent in their responses to their environment or their rider. They are so consistent that we can really work with that Mm -hmm. and that horses aren't doing things to be difficult or to be annoying. They're not, I don't believe, smart enough to do those things on purpose. They're just reacting. So if you can problem solve your way back to why your horse with its its instinctive and consistent 
nature, why is it doing a certain thing? And if you can fix or find that problem, mm-hmm. you solve it at that level okay. rather than what we call a Band-Aid effect where you try and cover up the tension or the loss of rhythm or the tightness in the back. Don't try to cover it up. Try and solve why. Why does it spook? Or why does it not listen to your leg? Yep, yep. Um, try to find the why and you get to the solution. It might be take a little longer to get there, but then it's consistent. Yes, yes. So finding the why rather than just blaming the horse. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, because they are just an instinctive, reactive animal. Yep, yep, yep. And if you can break it down to that level, then they are very simple. Yes. But it's sometimes hard to break it down to that level for some riders who might um, other things come into play, fear Mm -hmm. or frustration or sometimes ambition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've talked about, you know, you're looking forward to starting competing again. That's the main thing. Are you going to be competing your previous horse, Platinum Fire, or have you got another horse coming on? Tell us about what you've got planned in the next 12 months, two years. Yeah, look, it'll be it'll be closer to two years mm-hmm. and Platinum Fire will be an older teenager by then Yep. when I realised that um, I wasn't going to have the time to ride, you know, in the like, previous 24 months and then probably the next two years. I decided, yes, that he can he can retire once he's finished with his junior rider. Um, I've joked that he might end up as a lead rein pony at Pony Club, but for my the six year old child will be six, the horse will be twenty, but um, I don't think anyone else would support that. Um, so no, he he'll be retired um, because he's earned it. And honestly, I love the training and that's what gets me excited. So I can't wait to start again with a newer, younger horse. And no, I don't have anything mm-hmm. in the paddock waiting. I'll f- I'm sure I'll find something and br- you know, bring it on from scratch, see how far they go. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, if you're going to summarise your philosophy with horses into a couple of sentences, what would you say? How would you do that? Um, particularly from a, a rider's point of view. From a training you, point of view, yeah. Yes, yeah. from the rider and the training, you are your horse's personal trainer. Your horse is an athlete who has strengths and weaknesses and every day you come and ride your horse you or even just work with your horse on the ground, you are addressing or trying to improve their weaknesses while still letting them build their strengths. So very much that, you know, working with their body, working with their capabilities as though someone was going to a a gym and working themselves and just wanting to be a fitter, stronger person with a better posture. Mm -hmm. You can think of the horse's frame and carriage as its posture. So very much thinking about the horse and its body in your training sessions and probably, you know, really thinking of horses as problem solvers. So when picking an exercise, what does my horse need to strengthen? Its left hind leg. Um, What exercise, without just using more left leg and saying, come on, work harder, um, give it exercises that... Um, almost without it realising, end up working in bite-sized pieces. That hind leg, you do that enough times, it gets stronger, the horse gets more able, the horse suddenly is more capable and willing um, to perform the exercise that you have in, you know, the overall exercise. It might be a movement in a dressage test, it might be a certain height in your show jumping, um, but you've got to build build your you and your horse up to that level. Okay, okay. I think that was well well summarised and certainly done from a trainer's point of view. Vanessa, how can people contact you? They'll be able to do it. You know, we'll have all your contact details on horsechats.com slash 
Vanessa Canning, but if people would like to contact you direct, what's the best way? Um, my mobile phone is still um, my most uh, easiest way to get hold of me. Yep. Um, a text or a phone call is always the best. Okay. I do have a Facebook page. I don't get on it regularly, okay. um, but I, I, you know, it is how things go, and so I, I do use it. Um, people can contact me through that, or they can look up details um, and photos and things like that. But mm-hmm. definitely um, for yeah. All right. Would you, mobile phone contact. Would you like to say that number just in case anyone's there ready and <laughs> wanting to listen and take it yeah. down? Yep. Yeah, it's 0417 594 All right. And if people have missed that, then that'll be on horsechats.com slash Vanessa Canning or go to horsechats.com, search for Vanessa or search for Canning. And thanks very much, Vanessa, for your time today. I think those tips, uh, you know, just particularly with the focus on the improvement of the relationship are good, as well as your show jumping tips, and I think right through. So thanks for talking to us today, and hopefully we'll talk to you sometime again soon. My pleasure. Thank you, Glennis. Bye-bye. Bye. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.